history at our institution. We feel very privileged to have him with us. But it is not my function to introduce him to you, so I cannot reveal his name. <laughs> In any event, the presence of this gentleman on our faculty has prompted our Department of History to plan a series of public lectures during the fall semester on the general topic of the Cold War Revisited. It is our hope that uh, several lecturers of this type by nationally prominent speakers will be scheduled. Our intention is to bring to our local citizens new insights into recent and current international events and to increase their interests in our nation's foreign affairs. Now, if the autumn series proves successful, another series will be scheduled in the spring. So let me urge everyone here this evening to return for future lectures as they are announced. And let me ask all of you to bring your friends. Now, I shall turn over the program to the chairman of this series, the chairman of our Department of History, Dr. Joseph Logsdon, who will introduce the man having a name <laughs> and whom you have all come here to hear, Dr. Longson. I'm supposed to do the introduction but not give any jokes. I really don't have to introduce uh, George McGovern. <clears throat> You've come here tonight because you know him so well. I wish instead to express how privileged and honored I feel tonight. First, because so many of you came to this lecture series, this opening lecture in the series. Second, because my university gave me the opportunity to invite him. UNO, I think, has brought a spirit to this community that has encouraged thought, inquiry, and debate. The founders, such as Homer Hitt, Joseph Tragel, and George Branham, and many others, encourage this atmosphere, and I feel certain that it will continue in the future under new vigorous leadership. I also feel privileged because George McGovern accepted our invitation. He comes as a scholar, a historian, and a leading figure of our nation's life for the past quarter of a century. Our students perhaps are the most privileged. In his classes this semester, they have a rare and extraordinary opportunity. But I feel more than honored uh, for my department and my university. If I can be excused a personal and biased statement, I also wish to say that I feel proud this evening. It's not the pride of personal accomplishment, but of being. I'm proud that my craft of history produced such a statesman. But more, I am proud that my country produced such a leader during my adult lifetime. Through the triumph of our social progress, he made me proud. Through the tribulations of a terrible war, he made me proud. Through the triumph in the practice of our nation's ideals, he made me proud. Through our tribulations of national political disgrace, he made me proud. Someone once said of Adlai Stevenson that he made people feel proud to be Democrats. I feel no partisanship. Like other outspoken, honest, principled senators from his part of the country, Republican and Democrat, George Norris, Robert La Follette, 
Hubert Humphrey, George McGovern has made me proud, is making my children proud, and will make my children's children proud to be Americans. Thank you. Chancellor Rochelle, members of the faculty, the student body, and your guests at the uh, University of New Orleans. I, uh, I want, first of all, to thank uh, Professor Logsdon and Chancellor Rochelle for the uh, generous and, and kind remarks that have already been made here. I was thinking as that introduction of Joe's proceeded that Maybe I should get up here and announce for governor and the <laughs> <laughs> uh, Having been rejected in South Dakota, uh, maybe I should try Louisiana. Uh, in any event, uh, I'm honored to be a part of this university uh, community during this academic uh, year. I, I came here not only because I was invited, which pleased me, uh, but also because uh, I have a, a high regard for the vitality and the quality of, of this university, uh, and also for a, a personal reason, having lived in the North uh, most of my life, and yet being uh, an American who loves this country, uh, every part of it, I wanted to uh, come to know more on a first-hand basis about this part of the, uh, the United States. I hope I'll be uh, permitted just one uh, partisan reference here tonight, since I have not spoken in New Orleans frequently. Uh, if there are in this audience tonight, and I know there are a few, uh, people who, uh, who stood with me in that uh, presidential effort of uh, 1972, I want to take advantage of this opportunity just to thank you uh, for that. Uh, quite the way I had uh, <laughs> hoped it would. But I learned a, a very valuable lesson out of that experience, and that is that uh, in politics, and I suppose this is true in other areas of life, uh, there are some things that can happen to you that are even sadder and more uh, painful than losing an election or losing a single uh, battle. Uh, by that I mean I would much rather uh, be here at the University of New Orleans tonight with all of you as the uh, loser of that 1972 effort than to trade places with the man who defeated me. <laughs> purpose of this uh, lecture series. We're, uh, we're here tonight to uh, begin a series of lectures in which other uh, people from around the country will be uh, participating, as Chancellor Rochelle has said, uh, looking at the, uh, the Cold War in which we have been involved with the other uh, superpower for some 35 or 36 years now, perhaps the origins of it uh, go back much uh, further than that. And uh, tonight I would like to begin with some general uh, observations about that theme that will be uh, filled in more specifically and perhaps uh, more expertly by uh, others who will take up various aspects of the uh, Cold War struggle that has been such a transcendent force in American politics and American diplomacy uh, for as long as most of us in this room uh, can remember. Uh, 
When I uh, decided to seek the presidency of, of the United States in 1971 and 72, I did so because of my uh, deepening conviction that America had uh, almost lost sight of the uh, values and the ideals that had made us a, a great and exemplary nation, both in the uh, successful bid for the Democratic presidential nomination in the spring of 72, and then in the unsuccessful uh, election effort during the summer and fall of 1972, I uh, tested as a kind of a campaign phrase the uh, words, come home America. That was a phrase that was not original with me, but which appealed to me when I first heard it used by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, in the 1960s. The phrase and the, uh, and the concept underlying it were, uh, at bottom, conservative. They purported to, uh, to call the nation home to the uh, liberating ideals that Jefferson and his colleagues had written uh, into the founding documents of our history. But the call was, in another sense, uh, radical because if the nation were to renew its commitments to the ideals that had given it birth and uh, brought it to greatness, we would have to change drastically some of the policies and priorities we had been pursuing, at least since the end of the Second World War. The appeal consisting uh, of adherence on the one hand to the nation's uh, historic ideals, uh, combined, on the other hand, with the uh, rejection of some of its uh, current policies, may have uh, explained some of the controversy that surrounded my candidacy. In any event, uh, I'm more certain tonight than I was 10 years ago that America has been moving away from the most cherished and enduring values of our heritage. Come home America to the ideals of the founders is a more urgently needed message in the 1980s, in my judgment, than it was in the 1970s because we have uh, wandered so far away from the, uh, the ideals that inspired the American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, that we are today the world's most serious enemy of our own best traditions. It is, it is not... Uh, Moscow, or Peking, or Havana, that uh, fundamentally are reducing American influence and standing around the globe. It is our own misconceived policies. It is not fundamentally Japanese and German uh, industrial genius that is stripping us of our a competitive edge in the production of such items as automobiles or electronics or steel. It is the mistaken uh, priorities that we have set for the use of our own resources and our own technological and engineering talent. And these things, I think, have been largely true since the high point of American prestige and power at the end of the Second World War. That our power and prestige have been declining uh, economically, politically, and diplomatically, I think is self-evidenced. And there are some who would argue that even in the uh, military field, notwithstanding enormous uh, outlays for almost every conceivable weapon and, and uh, military strategy, uh, that even in that area, it is said we are in comparative decline. Now, what is the reason for this slippage in national power and effectiveness? I believe it is, to a large extent, the result of decisions going back to the immediate uh, post-World War II years and continuing 
to the present day. Policies that have given a negative, uh, fear-ridden cast uh, to American policy and the posture that we take uh, towards the world. That policy has distorted not only our uh, policy in the world, but our priorities here at home in our own uh, society. For three and a half decades, American policy has been shaped more by anti-communism than by any other single uh, factor. Now, of course, uh, that we emphatically reject communism and the, the denials of freedom associated with it uh, is a position that I, I think is justified. But rejection uh, of an alien ideology does not and cannot uh, of and by itself provide moral and political sustenance for a great nation. When the mood and the character of a country are shaped by what we hate and oppose instead of by what we love and what we stand for, then the, uh, the vision, the goals, the direction of the country begin to lose their motive power for us and their appeal for others. I think Americans prevail to a considerable extent in their challenge to colonialism right at the beginning, uh, notwithstanding uh, obvious and preponderant uh, British military might, but because we boldly affirm uh, the right of a people to the governance uh, of their own lives. And the new nation survived uh, and prospered because it concentrated on strengthening the uh, conditions of individual advancement for our own people while maintaining a decent respect for the opinions of mankind. So throughout uh, the first century and a half of our history, we were perceived around the world as a people uh, proclaiming the good news that a society could be free and just as well as prosperous and powerful. And it was these values that served as a giant magnet to millions of people who came here to our cities, our farms, our mines, our shops, our industries, and our uh, cultural endeavors. In countless uh, struggles all around the world where people were yearning for a greater measure of freedom and justice, America was perceived as a friendly, a steady force, an example and purveyor of the infectious philosophy of freedom and personal dignity. Our power throughout all of that period was not primarily based on the size of our armies. Indeed, uh, a strong aversion to large standing armies, to uh, compulsory conscription, and to militarism in any form were cardinal features uh, of the American system that we boasted about and were proud about. Rather, American power largely rested on the abundance of our national resources, the vitality of our economy, the dependability of our currency. You remember the phrase, sound as a dollar. <laughs> the common sense uh, safeguards of our constitutional and political system. And we did not project our power abroad uh, by stationing our troops and our arms around the globe. In John Quincy Adams' phrase, and I quote, wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be America's heart, her benedictions and her prayers but she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Nor did the uh, domestic strength and tranquility of the nation depend fundamentally on the force of arms. Indeed, the greatest crisis in the survival of the United States came in the 1860s uh, 
when Americans took up arms against each other in a struggle that came very close to uh, ending the Union of States. Not once uh, since that bitter experience have Americans seriously considered uh, settling their regional or ideological differences by force of arms. Anyone advocating that course in the uh, last century would have been considered mad. Following his defeat in the 1940 presidential election, the year that I graduated from high school, Wendell Wilkie, the Republican uh, challenger, made a, a globe-circling study mission to uh, assess the position of the United States abroad. As I recall it, that trip was suggested by the uh, victor in that campaign, President Roosevelt. But recording his thoughts in a, uh, in a small volume, One World, uh, Mr. Wilkie reported that in every part of the world that he visited, American power uh, rested to a remarkable degree on the perception that we were a free and decent people, not seeking to impose our will or our control uh, over others. I think that uh, Wilkie properly understood that military power, although uh, admittedly essential, was by itself uh, insufficient, and that America's most uh, important sources of strength lay in the vitality of our democracy, the health and well-being of our own people, and the soundness of our economy. And those have always been the foundations on which we build our prosperity and the general welfare of the nation in times of peace. And the same factors have enabled us no less than armed might to triumph over tyrants and militarists when we were challenged in warfare. America has been a great and an influential nation primarily because we believed in galvanizing ideals and because we stood for something in the life of the world. No one doubted that we were committed to the building of a democratic society. No one doubted the soundness of the dollar. It was regarded as perfectly natural and logical to talk openly about the American dream as the birthright uh, of every citizen. And as a youth growing up in South Dakota, and th then later uh, during the, the Great Depression, and as a combat uh, pilot in the Second World War, I never once heard any American express any doubt about the essential decency and fairness of our people, our government, and our national purposes. That doesn't mean that we were, we were perfect, but the, uh, the American people believed implicitly that our, our government and our, our people, for the most part, uh, stood for what was right and, and decent in the life of the world. But with the death of Franklin Roosevelt and the inevitable insecurities and tensions that uh, followed the most shattering and destructive uh, conflict in the history of the world, the Second World War, America, after, 18, after 1945, embarked on a different course, one that I think has gradually altered both the character of the nation and our standing around the world. We began to mold our policies and invest our most precious resources in a gigantic globe-circling enterprise calculated to contain communism and the Russians. Freedom was, was reinterpreted not uh, as an affirmation of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but as a global security combination that included any political uh, entity, however odious or tyrannical, as long as they oppose Moscow or its communist partners. And the test of success was, it was not the projection and the spread of American democratic ideals, but the enlistment of allies, the acquisition of bases, and the application of arms in the quest for national security against the hated 
a Soviet menace. The Soviets no doubt provoked this American post-war uh, strategy with Stalin's expansionist uh, policies in Eastern Europe. But after the first phase of the Cold War, the question of whose policy was the more provocative became increasingly ambiguous. Thoughtful uh, scholars of the Cold War are by and large divided as to which side was primarily responsible for the estrangement. All that can be said with certainty is that each side contributed to the fears and insecurities that drove the other. In any event, the Soviets quickly developed a nuclear capability to counter the supremacy of the American nuclear arsenal. They pressed their aid and their presence in every, every theater where we were involved and some where we were not. They did not hesitate to use brute force in controlling the states along their, their own western border, sending their tanks to crush uh, popular uprisings in Hungary in 1956 and in Czechoslovakia in 1968. And while trying to uh, be quiet about their military growth, the Russians deprived their own people of consumer goods in order to feed an expanding war machine. So more and more, the arms race became a test of Soviet and American resolve to prevent the other one uh, from becoming number one, always defined by the measure of military preponderance rather than of the comparative quality of the two societies. And more and more, these two great superpowers Washington and Moscow began to set the same priorities, an ever larger commitment of resources, of inventiveness, of technology, and of science to the military, and a declining commitment to economic competence, to political leadership, to industrial productivity, and to the needs of, of their own people. In World War II, I think it's fair to say, it was to a great extent the uh, cooperation of the Americans and the uh, Russians in their military effort that halted uh, German and Japanese bids to become the uh, world's uh, superpowers. But after the war, paradoxically, as the Soviets and the Americans fell into a kind of a mirror image post-war quest for global power and national security through arms, Germany and Japan forged ahead as the dynamic uh, new powers in industrial productivity and in international trade. The severe restrictions on military investment that was placed on the defeated Axis powers enabled them, I suppose quite contrary to the victor's intentions, to accomplish uh, peacefully and constructively the major uh, world roles that they had failed to achieve by force of arms. Conversely, the, qu the quest for security and power via the arms race has starved the Soviet uh, civilian economy and resulted at least in the neglect of the industrial uh, railway and energy modernization of America. Preoccupation with Cold War strategies involved us not only in a costly arms race, it also contributed, admittedly, along with Stalin's uh, aggressive policies, to our involvement in a bloody and exhausting uh, conflict in Korea, where American forces are still stationed tonight, 31 years later. Likewise, the fear of communism in general and of Soviet or Chinese expansion in particular, led us into the tragedy of Vietnam. That protracted, shattering experience in Indochina may conceivably have done more uh, to weaken the United States, both at home and abroad, than any other uh, single chapter in our history, at least in the 20th century. The political credibility gap 
weaken rather than strengthen the political and moral fabric of our country. Forty years of, of war, or intensive preparation for war, have not been good for the American soul. Extended preoccupation with warfare, either hot or cold, as Alexis de Tocqueville observed a century and a half ago, is a very serious strain on democracy. And there can be no more ironic paradox, I think, than the fact that in pursuing a strategy so relentlessly to counter the Soviets, the United States has on all too many occasions imitated some of the practices and tactics of the enemy we fear and despise. In a very perceptive observation written in 1949 by Archibald MacLeish, he said, and I quote, never in the history of the world was one people as completely dominated intellectually and morally by another people as were the people of the United States by the people of Russia in the four years from 1946 through 1949. Then continuing, Mr. McLeish said, American foreign policy in that period was a mirror image of Russian foreign policy. Whatever the Russians did, we did in reverse. American domestic politics were conducted under a kind of upside-down Russian veto. No man could be elected to public office unless he was on record as detesting the Russians. And no proposal could be enacted from a peace plan at one end to a military budget at the other unless it could be demonstrated that the Russians wouldn't like it. Even, even religious dogma, he said, was Russian dogma turned about. The first duty of a good Christian in, the, in those years in the United States was not to love his enemies, but to hate the communists. <laughs> now, if that observation by Archibald MacLeish, one of our wisest citizens, was pertinent in 1949, and I believed then, and I believe now that it was, how much more pertinent it is in 1981, 32 years later, after all this additional anti-Soviet strategy and, and struggle. All of this has been in my mind for many years. During the time that I sought the uh, presidency, uh, an elderly history professor at the <laughs> University of South Dakota who was being interviewed by Life magazine offered an observation that I still cherish. He said that I was the only presidential candidate nominated by uh, either one of the major political parties uh, since the death of Franklin Roosevelt, who was largely free from the assumptions of the Cold War. The question now, however, is what do those of us do who dissent from past or present policy, what do we recommend for the future? It's much easier to analyze the past than it is to chart a safe and prudent course for the future. And yet I would again appeal to tried and tested values in considering the course ahead. For me, the way out of the wilderness still lies in focusing our vision on the Judeo-Christian ethic and its practical application in the philosophies of Jefferson and Lincoln, Roosevelt and Wilson. What is that vision and how can it be made meaningful to Americans in the 1980s? I think first and foremost we must reorder our attitudes in a positive direction based on loyalty and adherence to our own values rather than on fear and hate of alien values. We must stop now approaching the rest of the world primarily 
uh, to contain and defeat the Soviets. Warfare, both hot and cold, should be relegated to history's scrap heap of obsolete doctrines. Practical terms, this means, as uh, Ambassador George Kennan has said recently, one of the men who I suspect knows the most about the Soviet Union, it means a step-by-step -step process beginning with an immediate cutback in expenditures for arms. The argument about whether we or the Soviets has the bigger nuclear arsenal is a foolish discussion that has been irrelevant ever since each side, uh, some years ago, achieved the capability of absorbing a first strike and still having enough left over to retaliate with sufficient explosive power to destroy the attacker. Having achieved that posture on both sides a number of years ago, the billions and billions of dollars we have spent on nuclear overkill since that time have been largely wasted and indeed have contributed more to the inflation of the country than they have to its security. The current proposal to construct the uh, MX missile, the most costly weapon system ever conceived in any country in the history of warfare and other new uh, complicated devices of that kind would simply add to the waste and the futility of the arms race without increasing our security one iota. If we would halt the further pileup of this needless nuclear overkill, the Soviets might very well follow suit. But even if they didn't, even if they didn't, even if they didn't, it would be their waste and their weakness, not ours. If I could just uh, digress for a, a moment. Uh, back in 1963, we had been struggling for some time to uh, find a basis for ending the explosion of nuclear weapons, the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, because the scientists and the doctors were reporting that the deadly uh, radio, radioactivity thrown off by those tests was beginning to show up in the milk and in the livestock and in the food and in the bones of our, of our children. And the question was, how do you get an agreement out of the Soviets? How do you trust them? Who's going to take the first step? Well, all kinds of efforts were made to get a treaty, and nothing seemed to be working until one day uh, President Kennedy was making the commencement address at American University <laughs> on the 10th of June, 1963, and he simply announced that we were going to stop testing uh, weapons in the atmosphere and that uh, we would not resume it if the Soviets didn't resume it. And that broke the logjam. A few weeks later, the Soviets signed the nuclear test ban treaty, the Senate ratified it, and neither country has exploded a bomb in the atmosphere uh, from that day to this. Now, to me, uh, that's the kind of uh, leadership uh, that is needed uh, today. Uh, I know how nervous my fellow citizens are about the defense of this country, and obviously uh, none of us, myself included, uh, would want the United States to embark on a course that uh, threatens our national uh, defense. But it cannot be emphasized too strongly that we have more, vastly more, than we need of nuclear weapons and delivery systems to devastate the Soviet Union right now without one additional bomb, without one additional missile. 10,000 of these strategic nuclear warheads 
in the American arsenal that we're capable of delivering, each one infinitely more devastating than either of the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima or Nagasaki some 36 years ago. And there is no way that the Soviets can eliminate that capacity, and they know it. If that does not, does not add up to military sufficiency, I cannot imagine what would. It is therefore as costly and stupid for the Russians to waste money on nuclear overkill as it is for, Ru for us. And if we can beat the Russians in an arms reduction a competition, we will be that much wiser and stronger in the end. Because, uh, <laughs> nothing has weakened either America or Russia more in recent decades than the waste uh, of talent and resources and military overkill, and nothing will strengthen us faster than to halt this national uh, dissipation uh, of wealth. Soviet American arms reduction, a verifiable treaty along the lines of the SALT II treaty, which uh, those of us in the Senate very foolishly uh, failed to, uh, to ratify, along with the uh, detente involving increased trade and scientific, medical, and cultural cooperation between these two uh, huge countries, <laughs> represents such obvious uh, common sense and mutual interest that one wonders what the debate is all about. But that kind of approach to the uh, Soviet Union would not only uh, open the way for uh, more reasonable relations with them, but would help us in approaching small uh, communist uh, countries that for some reason we seem to be even more frightened of uh, than we are the uh, Chinese or the, uh, or the Russians. Uh, would also become easier. There's no practical reason. There's no claim of, uh, of national interest that prevents us from opening up uh, normal relations with little <coughs> countries like Angola, or Mozambique, or Cuba, or Vietnam, or Nicaragua. All of these little <laughs> uh, all of these little countries have expressed the desire for better relations with us. And each one of them, uh, while it's limited, uh, has some uh, significance and influence uh, in the rest of the world. So for us to recognize them and, and deal with them positively would demonstrate the self-confidence and enlightened uh, self-interest of a mature nation. And I think it would enhance respect for our common sense on the part of the rest of the world. Now there are uh, obviously a few murderous, totally paranoid tyrants in our uh, time, such as uh, Idi Amin, the deposed uh, leader of Uganda, or Paul Pod of Cambodia, who doubtless should be shunned and perhaps even removed uh, through a cooperative effort of all nations acting under the authority of the UN. Uh, if, I, uh, if I were military age and the situation presented itself, I would uh, volunteer for uh, military service to eliminate an Idi Amin or a Pol Pot with the same certainty that has always made me proud that I volunteered to help put an end to Adolf Hitler. But, uh, but as a general rule, as a general rule, and allowing of only rare exceptions, it is far better for us and for others to maintain open relationships with all other nations, along with a policy of non-intervention in their internal uh, affairs. It takes a very extreme example, like, uh, like a Hitler, uh, to justify a, a different course. The second thing we must do is, is join with the uh, other developed nations, including the Soviet Union, with the United Nations and the World Bank to reduce hunger and poverty, uncontrolled population growth, and the environmental uh, destruction of the planet. There are few, if any, really crucial problems of our time 
that can be resolved except through uh, international cooperation. As matters now stand, the nations of the world are devoting approximately $600 billion annually uh, to armaments. That amount ought to be cut in half and at least some of the savings invested uh, in an international effort to improve the agriculture, the uh, transportation, the energy, the environment, the nutrition and family planning measures of the developing world. Now an effort to uh, An effort like that may be judged altruistic, to be sure, but contrary to what we have been hearing uh, recently, there's nothing wrong with caring about other people. It's not even on America. And, uh, and I might uh, add, it also happens to be hard-headed realism. It is those who seek security through arms while neglecting the fundamental conditions of a stable and just world order who are the unrealistic dreamers of our time. The final thing we must do is closely related to steps one and two, and that's to redirect our spending and uh, investment priorities in our own society. Cutting uh, unnecessary the military outlays in half would free a great deal of money and resources and talent, part of which could be invested in the uh, revitalization of our, of our own society. Again, if I could just digress for a moment, uh, I've been very interested as a senator in the railways uh, of the United States because my state is so vitally dependent on rail transportation. Uh, and yet, uh, in that state where we have to move the grain and, and the uh, lumber and the coal and other things, the railways are falling apart. Unfortunately, that's true in a, in a good many other parts of the, uh, the country. The town that I live in, Mitchell, is named after the founder of the Milwaukee Railroad. Most of the towns in South Dakota are there because the railway came through. Now the railways are dying. It has occurred to me uh, many times that when we talk about being number one, and Americans like to, to think that way, and I understand that, uh, we must not be thinking about the railways. Uh, in, our, uh, in our state, uh, in our state uh, we have no passenger traffic at all. The uh, tracks are so decrepit that the uh, freight trains that are left have now been slowed down to uh, eight or nine miles an hour to keep them from bouncing off the track. We've had three trains in South Dakota uh, recently that have fallen off the track while they were standing still. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, I, uh, I, remember, uh, I remember back in the, uh, the Second World War how, how we depended on on rail. See, to me, I spent half the war riding uh, trains back and forth across the country, and I was a pilot. Uh, but uh, we, we depended on those railways to, uh, to win the war. I guess it was even more true in the, uh, in the First World War. So even from the standpoint of defense, if you're too uh, tough-minded to listen to some of these appeals about helping uh, people directly, uh, uh, think about the, uh, the security of the country. And I would suggest to you that our policy planners ought to think very carefully about a choice that we might make as to whether or not uh, we would contribute more to the security and defense of the country by spending a million dollars on an MX missile and sticking it out on underground railways in Utah and Nevada, where they don't want it anyway, uh, then, uh, then we would to spend that hundred billion dollars revitalizing the rail system and giving the United States one of the best rail systems in the world, which contributes the most to the uh, greatness of the world. Now, I, uh, I don't want to be specific here tonight in outlining 
alternative uh, domestic uh, proposals. That can come at a later, later time, but I believe in any event that spirit and philosophy are more important right now than uh, programmatic formulae. I've suggested here only a few uh, basic steps that might be consistent with an America devoted as we were at the beginning to life, uh, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what I appeal to is not partisanship or any rigid ideological formula. Rather, I would appeal in Lincoln's phrase to the better angels of our nature. Many years ago, Walter Lippmann observed, we are trying to be too shrewd, too clever, too calculating, when what the anxious and suffering peoples cry out to us for is that we practice the elemental virtues and adhere to the eternal verities. They alone can guide us through the complications of our days. I think the American dream is, in fact, an affirmation of those eternal verities that Walter Lippmann spoke of, of respect for the dignity and worth of every human being, a sense of stewardship towards the planet that sustains our lives. I think it's time for a rededication to that dream that can make America the great and good land that it can be when we reach for the ideals that gave us birth. So I still say, 10 years later, come home America. After this very uplifting uh, speech, uh, Senator McGovern has agreed to answer questions, and uh, I will welcome the first question. Yes. was that uh, many people are alarmed about the uh, present uh, incumbent leadership, Republican leadership. Is there any uh, obvious Democratic alternative, Democratic uh, leadership? Uh, I think uh, I think uh, as one who's been watching very closely what has uh, happened since the election, watching my former uh, colleagues in the Senate uh, and in the House, that the, uh, the uh, Democrats have been in a kind of a state of shock and uh, disarray uh, since the election. I, I think very few of us anticipated the uh, dimensions of the election of 1980 when the um, strong Democratic majority in the Senate vanished and suddenly became a, a Republican majority. In the House, to be sure, there's a working, uh, there's a Democratic majority in America, but I think most people who've looked at that situation would agree that uh, when you look at the way some Democrats vote, that probably there's not a working uh, majority for any group other than the more conservative members of the, of the House. Uh, as, to, uh, as to what can be done about that situation, uh, what I've been recommending is that the uh, Democrats use this period uh, when they're not in power, when they're not in the White House and lost the Senate and very razor-thin margin in the House, uh, 
uh, to spend some time uh, carefully developing some alternative approaches to the major uh, questions that face the country. I don't think we can go back in 1984 with the same agenda that we took to the country uh, in 1980. I don't want to get into a bit the business here tonight of uh, criticizing uh, particular individuals, but uh, there has been a tendency to kind of coast in recent years on proposals that have been in fact in effect for a long time, programs that I think generally have, uh, have been quite a, effective, especially the domestic uh, programs, but uh, to drift along with the same priorities, very high levels of military outlays, uh, not too much careful uh, supervision of some of the domestic uh, programs. And it does seem to me there's some issues that have scarcely been addressed at all. Uh, I touched on the energy question just in passing tonight. I don't know what the democratic program is on energy. I don't think we have one. Uh, I don't think the Republicans have one. Uh, what you have is a mishmash of differing views that uh, have not produced a consensus yet as to what the country ought to do. We, we can't survive and prosper as a, an advanced industrial society without an up-to-date energy uh, policy. And uh, we kind of drift along year to year without really thinking through uh, what we're going to do. I remember back in 1973, during the oil embargo, when President Nixon announced Project Independence, that by the end of the decade, we were going to be free of importing oil. Uh, we haven't done that at all. We've gone just the other way. We're more dependent on oil imports today than we were when we announced uh, Project Independence. So. Uh, uh, I think that's just one example of the kind of hard challenges that faces. We, uh, uh, and one of the advantages of being out of office, and uh, being out of power, I'm speaking also about Democrats who are still in office, but not the majority party at the moment, they do have an opportunity now to uh, uh, look at these problems from a little longer range perspective and come up with uh, an alternative range of answers. I formed this group, Americans for Common Sense, not simply to counter the simplistic solutions that are being offered by the so-called new right, uh, but also because I think uh, groups like that have to begin focusing their best energies and talent and minds on developing some better answers to the basic problems that, uh, that face the country. Um, I, I really don't want tonight to talk about the personalities that I think are the most uh, appealing in terms of 82 and 84, but to talk really about the issues that we have to address and the kind of procedures we're going to have to follow to begin turning the country in a more uh, hopeful direction. Uh, please think, though, of what I, about what I said tonight about the Cold War and national defense. What we really need is a new and broader ne definition of national defense that it goes beyond simply counting the number of nuclear weapons we have. Uh, defense really has to do with education. Uh, it has to do with uh, the economy. Uh, it has to do with uh, the environment, with energy, with railways. Uh, with the confidence of our people in our own government. Th those things also to contribute to the security and, uh, and defense of the country. And uh, so I would plead here tonight for a, a new definition of national defense.